Thanks, Steve. OCW part two. Um, I'm going to take my time here uh, to reflect on a few other themes of directions that we're heading with forward-looking work and you know, places that, that may have some interesting overlap and resonance with things happening in the, the Filecoin distributed web community. Um, discovery and context, global accessibility, and how to keep our content current while being good stewards of the archive. Those are the three things. Um, so in terms of discovery and context, um, it was mentioned uh, in the session this morning, you know, we're, we're running on the current site a, um, a web-based search engine, um, and that is the one-stop shop for, every, for everybody who's using you know, the OCW website right now. Um, this, is, this is the path that you go through to discover content. Um, so there's a you know elastic search engine running uh, the content is all deep indexed and the the facets which you see displayed here a little bit on the on the left side of that image are primarily driven by manually injected um, metadata tags uh, with some of that information there's a there's a layer of of um, team curating content collections um, but by and large we're trying to have this one Unified search interface be, you know, the self-serve place for everybody to find everything they want and to discover content in terms of the course sort of construct as well as individual resources. The direction that we hope that this is heading um, is to, to enhance the, uh, the nature, the quality of the results with semantic search technologies and some generative AI, which we've, we've had, uh, had our team starting to experiment with. Um, there continues to be a big need from our learners that we hear about, you know, you're showing me these courses and these materials without necessarily all the context that I need. Can you help me understand where to start and how this thing fits into the MIT curriculum and to any sort of sequential pathway that might be relevant to me? Um, along with that, um, I showed in a, in, a, in a previous slide, you know, beyond the website, it's really important to us at OCW that our content makes its way out into the ecosystem, that people download, remixing, and reusing. And so associated with the discovery functionality that's on our website, it's, you know, it's in many ways just as important for how OCW materials are discovered out in other places. So whether that's through Google or um, open education repository, referatories like OER Commons, um, those things are ingesting our materials and the metadata that's attached to it and trying to run with it in good ways. And so you know, our team is trying to pay attention and be in conversation with folks who are doing that sort of work in a collaborative spirit. Next theme, um, global accessibility. Yes, accessibility in terms of, of like um, the you know, W3C guidelines for web content, absolutely. And that's been foundational to the work that our project has always done. But more broadly, it's, you know, this is recognizing that, that our users are coming from a lot of different places, um, a lot of different tech, a lot of different settings. And so making sure that the content works well for people who aren't just on internet connected laptops, but on mobile devices and, you know, disrupted connectivity is really important. And this, you know, breadth of distribution channels uh, will, you know, will always be important to us. You know, the, the fact that all of our videos up on YouTube, you know, we're thrilled because there are so many people for whom that's their default starting point for videos to learn from. But, um, you know, there are challenges and risks with having so many eggs in that basket, no question. So, you know, um, continuing in the future to work on closing some of the some of the gaps, such as the extension of the mirror site program, is really key. Um, uh, ensuring that we we make our content more easily adapted, customizable, localized for different learning communities is really important as well. And so, you know, it starts with things like making sure the content is easy to download and ingest into other platforms, but also opening ourselves to work that, you know, that other emerging tech is able to do. You know, we, we seem to be approaching possibly a tipping point where the quality of, 
of automated translations, while not perfect, is getting good enough for at least some topics and some, some subjects. You know, the advanced graduate level stuff and the jargon that's in there, it's probably always going to need a substantial amount of human interaction. But um, I think, you know, um, breaking free of the, the language dominance of English is, is a key part of global accessibility as well, and one, one to pay a, attention to. And, and of course, you know, you know, we're going to be continuing to look for alternatives to centralized commercial big tech as, as part of our infrastructure solution. Um, so this, um, there's a sort of a tension or a balance that we have to strike between keeping the OCW site current and vibrant with regards to what's happening in the MIT curriculum and on these topics in the world and being good stewards for what's now over 20 years of publications, you know, and things that aren't say necessarily the latest and greatest version, but um, for certain communities and certain, certain questions, those old classes, which may date from the mid eighties in the case of uh, SICP or older, you know, have great value. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sort of default mindset for many in our open education community that after stuff's a few years old, I just don't want to see it. And so there's some work that we need to invest in, in lifting up things that have these, these sort of, uh, archival values. Um, another thing that's been really important in keeping our, our content current and vibrant is recognizing that as opposed to 20 years ago, when, um, we did have by necessity, a pretty centralized team approach to converting the raw course materials and putting them online. I mean, I was going back with armloads of paper files out of people's filing cabinets and getting them scanned. We don't have to do that anymore. And increasingly, um, our faculty and the departments are, are creating good public-facing websites. They're not necessarily cleared for Creative Commons licensing. They don't necessarily speak as clearly as we might like to an off-campus community, but things are moving in a direction where our team perhaps needs to do less and less of this like adapt, you know, pulling in, ingesting all the materials and storing them on our site. And so we're increasingly making use of these things we call pointer pages, which are turning OCW in some sense into a referatory and pointing to websites that are, you know, that are already up and running. Just published a couple of weeks ago, you know, here's an example of a very current topic and one which is, is rapidly evolving. You know, some colleagues in the Environmental Solutions Initiative here at MIT just published the first round of the Climate Justice Instructional Toolkit. And I know this is going to be, you know, iterated frequently um, we wanted to get it out there as quickly as possible, and we don't want to get in the way of sharing with our millions of OCW users the latest stuff that might show up on the ESI website. And so we, we create a homepage, we attach some metadata to it so it shows up on a discovery, but then we hand it off to the toolkit's website through a link on our, on our site. That stuff's not going to show up currently in our mirror drive, but perhaps some of these solutions that we've been talking about to, you know, intentionally and with robustness make sure that there's a really reliable web archive of these things, and perhaps that can be pushed out along with the, in, in quotes, mirror drive to different places might be a really interesting way to, to, to keep up with keeping the OCW presentation of this material current while, you know, being a little bit less decentralized, being a little bit more decentralized, less in control of where that content is. Um, so I look forward to uh, making some progress there, you know, um, and, you know, aligned with this, you know, our team historically has had to deal with tons of, you know, uh, external links that our content makes use of, uh, as, as they call it, link rot, you know, thousands of these things per year are showing up and to date our team is primarily handling those in a manual way. And we know there's better solutions that we look forward to learning about from, uh, from your community and others. Uh, so that's, you know, at a high level, you know, a few of the future directions that we're heading in OCW, you know, there's other things that maybe to me seem less relevant to this community, but these are, these are things I thought would be, uh, you know, ring most true for here. So thank you.
All right, hello, good afternoon. I'm Nathan with Guardian Project and Proof Mode. Um, the pitch from the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web when I first was gladly introduced to them was about you know preserving humanity's most essential content. And that framing um, really resonated with our work around human rights and humanitarian um, contexts uh, and thinking about how to ensure that the human observation, the knowledge uh, of reality is not lost for many reasons and um, causes. So why am I here in front of you? Uh, I'm not, I am, a, I am an affiliate with the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, which I'm always appreciative of. Um, but for me, this all began back in the late 80s with hosting a BBS on my 286. Um, that was my first experience with decentralization. My, my brother left for college and left me. I inherited his second phone line on which I could run a BBS, and that was very exciting. Um, fast forward into college through University of California. I worked on the Digital Library Initiatives, which was a decentralized library project um, that taught me a great deal. Um, then I began uh, with my interest in mobile, working at Palm on secure email solutions and the Trio era and the Tungsten era. Um, and then I had this growing interest in human rights and environmentalism and activism, and somehow I merged all these wonderful things together into a free and open source organization that does mobile security and privacy software for human rights. So that's what Guardian Project is, and this is some of my fantastic team of all shapes and sizes. So I, the four questions that we were asked at the beginning, I took these questions seriously, um, and I'll touch on them here. Um, I think of decentralization, um, not a hive mind, but, you know, like an ant colony, you know, and our colony is the planet Earth or any sort of collective you want to think of. And we all want to just do our part and know how to communicate and know where to get our resources and know how to like fit into a system where we can achieve the things we want, be it happy life or change or family or um, culture. And so that's one idea of decentralization is um, maybe how ants work. The second one is um, around knowledge distribution and preservation. So um, I'm Portuguese. Uh, we do make wine. My brother just made wine in California, um, small batch family wine. And he, the cask is an ama amazing technology for preservation um, and distribution. If you think what it allowed for all sorts of wine and liquor to know it's going to get on the ship or get distributed from here to there, it'll preserve it. You know the provenance based on the stamp. So that's one idea of like, how do we keep these precious cargo safe as it travels all around the world and make sure we know who it came from and what it is. In terms of the stakeholders and players today, um, this image is, you know, we've got the cloud up top. We all know what that represents. Then we have this island. So there's different data islands, maybe at universities and organizations. Then we have all the little people living on the islands. And then we have the boats like zipping between the islands. So there's various metaphors here that are not just the cloud to think about when we're talking about the players. And then what's at stake? So this is actually footage that was captured using our proof mode application and verified through our proof mode system. This is from a indigenous caravan in the south of Mexico, um, El Sur Resiste, um, documenting uh, parts of a, an area that have been destroyed um, based on rising seas and changes in climate. And this is an authenticated video that they wanted to capture to tell their own story. And we risk losing this stuff for many reasons, um, which we'll talk, I'll talk more about and talk about with them today. So about 10 years ago, through our work with the amazing witness.org, um, human rights organization founded by Peter Gabriel, after the Rodney King beating and this idea that, wow, what if everyone had cameras? Amazing idea. But then we started talking with them about we should be able to verify what it is you think was captured by a camera. So 10 years ago, even more, we started working on this and proof mode is what has come of it. Um, and it's a way to enhance audio visual content with extra metadata verified and captured in certain ways, hardware verification and digital signing in a way that's simple and usable by anybody. So, all of this effort really came to fruition, sadly, through the war in Ukraine. Um, this is a human rights documentarian. This is what 
the person looks like working with the Starling Foundation and others, who's another grantee of FFDW, documenting a school bombing in Kharkiv. And this was, um, there were not children in the school when it was bombed, um, but still a very traumatic scene. But this school was said to be, oh, it's used by the soldiers, by uh, Ukrainian troops, but it wasn't. And they're there to document this and to create a dossier using proof mode and other tools, a, a workflow that they've created to create a cryptographic dossier that can be submitted to the International Criminal Court. Um, so they're, they did, this is all, all them. I was happy that proof mode was there as a building block that helped them ensure that the chain of custody from the pixels on the sensor could be maintained to the submission to the ICC. So shout outs to them and Haifa and others involved. So as I said, proof mode adds additional verification and metadata. Hopefully this works, yes. Um, we then have different ways of sharing proof. You can share a fingerprint, like a notarization. And all of this is using things like SHA-256 hashes and PGP and all of this. But to the user, they don't know any of this, um, which was a big goal. So you can share a notarization fingerprint over a text message if you don't have a lot of internet. You can share a robust proof bundle, which has the image and all the sidecar files in a zip file. And you can save it locally if you're offline and need to do sneaker net sort of um, sharing by copying or airdrop. So proof mode itself is a decentralized application that uses the internet if it's available, but fails gracefully if there isn't. And is still valuable in all of those situations. And we have a whole design from the margins approach where we think about users in these more um, disconnected, low bandwidth, difficult economic situations first. And so that's how this was designed. We also make sure our Data uses well-known standards like PGP, CSV, um, JSON, just files that regular people, when this court case finally gets to the ICC, who knows how long it'll take, you'll be able to parse these things. They're simple file formats using open source software. There's nothing proprietary about what we've created in there. So we have a built-in camera. You can also just use it with any camera on your device. I'm gonna skip ahead here, okay. So we worked with this indigenous caravan group in the south of Mexico. We have a long history here of working with activists in that region around digital security and other issues. And they really loved proof mode. And they came to us with this idea that um, they wanted to document this two week caravan and they're going to all of these sites impacted by development and um, climate change. And so they documented encounters with police. They documented these different sites, these important cultural sites. And we now have that as a proof archive of this event happening that can be verified and stored as knowledge and learning. Please come in. Um, so this is an example of some of the work that proof mode enables. And we also work with, in Middle East and North Africa, a journalist organization known as Fasila with a decentralized network of journalists in many countries. And they're using proof mode to kind of um, backstop their, their investigative journalists and their news to, by, by capturing B-roll footage with proof mode in the places where they're doing their storytelling. And again, all of this will be stored and, and ready to, if, if their stories are questioned, it's ready to be verified. And all of this is being preserved on IPFS and Filecoin. Um, I also did on Earth Day with my kids, went to the Cape and did a verifiable beach cleanup day. Um, <laughs> And a lot of people say they did a beach cleanup and they just went there and posed for Instagram and said, look, aren't I cool? This is every piece of trash we picked up. <laughs> There's more even, um, all verifiable, verifiable by timestamp, signature. Um, and what's interesting is if you think of this not just as photos, but as data, you know, what things over time kind of trash was there and what evolved um, each year? And could we collectively create this map that's again verifiable, stored in a decentralized way um, for research. Um, we have some big ideas um, developed by our data science lead, Jack Fox Queen, um, who, um, Keen, Jack Fox Keen, thank you very much, Jack. Um, integrity, consistency, and synchrony. There's a great blog post on this, but what we mean by proof has a very specific idea, and how we verify is important, longer than I can get into today. Um, but we have a tool called Proof Check, which is a 
DAP, a decentralized app that lives on IPFS. It's a fully uh, self-contained progressive web app that contains Python code and JavaScript code and runs on your computer if you hit that URL. And when you run our data through it, it doesn't leave the computer. It does everything locally uh, within the, the web app. It verifies signatures, does everything. You can also put in an IPFS content ID to retrieve the content to verify. So we've done some, with support of FFDW, really advanced work in building browser-based decentralized apps. Um, I'm gonna have to go faster, too much to talk about. Um, you might have seen this CR symbol from Adobe and others about this is how you'll know it. something's made by generative AI. That same label and symbol can be used to label something as authentically created by a human. That's how we use it. It's a new standard called C2PA for embedding cryptographically signed metadata in any media file. Historic media file, new medias, generative AI created. So we interoperate with that standard and are one of the experts on that standard and the open source library called C2PA, Rust, and JS. So I'm happy to talk about that. We use this standard, which is important. That's how it looks if you use the command line tool. It's very cool. Okay. So um, if you want to scan this QR code, what this all ends up meaning is there is a site that Adobe has called Behance, which supports the standard. And every photo that gets uploaded in there, you see this content credentials box. And then you can tap on it and understand kind of the source and the capture and some of the provenance. And so this is starting to roll out where you might see this on WordPress, Mastodon, and on the web, the CR logo or content credentials. And so that verifiable beach cleanup, which we've published on IPFS, you'll scan that code, it'll open our proof check app, it'll fetch it from the decentralized web and run the verification. It's like doing a view source on media with PGP signatures. And then this all integrates with Adobe and their tools. So I believe this decentralized web can look like, as I said, apps that work with and without internet, that share storage nearby, that don't need to use the cloud, but can also um, you know, collaborate with, with others. Um, communities are empowered to document their own causes, retain control, choose what's distributed and when. Um, there's many ways to distribute proof, including through Signal and Bluetooth. I think the open source, uh, the key players change to open source, the people creating the documentation, marginalized communities, um, community networks, academic institutions. Um, and what's at stake really is like trust in reality of like, did this thing happen and, and did I see it or was this made by an AI? Um, Last night on the radio, local pop radio here, uh, the, the announcement said, you know, with all these TikTok filters and Gen, I, Gen AI, I don't really know what's real anymore. Um, and my daughter sort of laughed with me at that. So um, we're creating a project called Baseline. This is all this, these groups, we've helped to fund their time to be part of our baseline effort to capture the world verifiably. Um, this is sort of our version of like Google Earth or something, but I'm not quite sure yet. And all of this is stored on IPFS and Filecoin. Um, this is an idea I had, and I might have to skip, you might have to skip forward, but so we created it. This is from another data set that captured a indigenous cultural activity. Let me turn it down a little. Um, in this area um, of Cholula State that um, it's called Los Vo uh, Voladores. It'll show it in a second. The importance of this footage is A, there's a volcano happening and there's ash everywhere, but B, the person featured in this doing this um, event that's going to come up is a woman, and traditionally only men have done it. And documenting the fact that this elder person is passing it down, I believe, to his daughter um, is important. So if you see that QR code that just appeared there, you could scan it and get all the view source information behind this video. And throughout the video, there's certain points where you could scan that and then again, run the verification process yourself and get access to the Creative Commons license raw materials. So this is one of the ideas we have that this is all verified footage with timestamps, with QR codes and so on. And I'll just go real quick. You can see this ash. This event was threatened because there was a volcano nearby that was spewing ash. And then this is the practitioner of this really cool thing we don't have time to watch where they climb this really tall pole and spin around in the air. 
Um, and often if I show this to someone from Mexico, they said, oh, I didn't know women did that. And we have verifiable proof that women do this activity. Um, we also now announcing today our first public release of the Cape Town data set for baseline over the last year. Uh, we have 20 gigs of documentation of beautiful Cape Town. Um, and this is again hosted on IPFS. It's been verified and you can go through it and I'll share this link later, but that's published raw on IPFS and also through our own IPFS gateway. Um, this is a beautiful moment of reality that has been verified and captured by proof mode. There, uh, he's up in a hot air balloon. And, you know, we don't want to lose this. This is real life. Um, this isn't a video game or AI, um, but it also um, is important for the future and storytelling and a view of like, yeah, this is Africa. Beautiful place. So, Lastly, shout out to um, Catherine D'Ignazio, Lauren Klein, a little MIT shout out on data feminism. Um, Jack Fox Keen on my team get, has a great talk and blog post on this intersectional, intersectional approach to data. And please read the post and read the book and think about everything we're doing from the, a data feminist standpoint. It's really important um, and it's an excellent framework for, for all of this. My team, all shapes and sizes and backgrounds and places, and they're awesome. I wish they could all be here today. And here they are again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I'm curious where things are at with um, building community uh, engagement among researchers and you know you had that diagram of like eight different domains around around baseline i'm thinking for instance the uh, the rapidly growing community of researchers at mit and colleagues who are doing you know tremendous amount of environmental data monitoring and is it in their sites that they should be using some of these practices or the benefits of using these practices in the the data that they're collecting now it's definitely in their sites. The Gen AI explosion made people a lot more concerned about it more quickly um, with all kinds of data. Um, and the people are dabbling using proof mode. They're very excited about there being a standard um, around C2PA. So I think um, this, they're also using IPFS for the immutability. Um, we also rely on timestamping notaries like Open Timestamps and others to say this existed at this place in time. So I think um, there hasn't been wide scale adoption. One of the reasons we're funding adoption is to just show that it's possible. We do have groups that want to use proof mode um, on a uh, Raspberry Pi with a camera and like to monitor um, areas of the Amazon, for instance. Um, we also have people that use it to monitor poaching and illegal logging. So um, yeah, it's bits and pieces. I think the, we're really backing the C2PA standard because time to get on the train and hopefully it takes off. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug that the Open Climate Campaign, which a big part of its emphasis is working with researchers to openly share their data. Um, I have not heard this discussed in those conversations. And so we want to, we're, we're going to be putting out some basic step-by-step -step workflows, right? Document, add verifiability, publish immutably, right? And publish on your own node, pin it to a system, and basically create a reusable workflow that is, should be very simple to adopt. This is our third year of plan for the Filecoin support is basically scale adoption to human rights and others groups. So yeah, I'm, I think they just need that, like, give me the five step. Definitely. Thing. Thanks. So I'm gonna do that point thinly masquerading as question, actually not masquerading at all. So I'm going, I just wanted to contextualize this a little bit. I suddenly realized that we're gonna have such a diverse set of, of projects talked about, and there is some meat, there is some, some structure behind the madness of giving money to all of these projects. And to contextualize proof mode in the thing I said at the introduction, where um, one of the aims with, with, with proof mode and systems like this is to separate the process of guaranteeing authenticity from authority. 
So uh, the 70% solution for centralized stuff is, well, you know this is real because somebody said it was real, right? And somebody in an important authority situation. So a lot of things people uh, default to with centralized systems is we really want Facebook to decide what's real. And then because Facebook told us it was real, it really is real. And that's both a description of the problem and the solution that a lot of people who aren't trying to challenge the centralized model um, to send to. With something like proof mode, we can separate those two things, right? We, you're not, this isn't genuine because somebody said this was genuine. This is genuine because it, it, the data is clustered around it so you can see that it came from this particular source um, directly. And I think that's important because that's kind of a 100% solution, right? That doesn't depend on these central authorities. And that's particularly important because Actually, if you look at the practical consequences, both me and Nathan comes from the human rights uh, human rights background, the problem isn't just like random people on the internet faking data. The actual pernicious problem with disinformation stuff like that is people in very powerful positions of authority of data um, create either fake data or make claims about data that people are likely to believe because of the, author the, the respect they grant that authority. So a lot of this is actually about discriminating this sort of data that you can rely on from the data that someone else is saying it is real. So, sorry, I just yeah, and that um, what's interesting is with something like the C2PA standard, you know, Adobe is implementing it in a very Adobe way. It's in this creative cloud, right? It's centralized through their identity provider. They they want you to get a commercial certificate authority certificate. Um, we are doing it in the opposite way. Our data is stored in IPFS. We're doing self-signed and peer-signed certificates. It's all, you know, you don't have to use the cloud. So it's important to have those of us who, who can implement things in a decentralized way doing so. The other part about the standard and our proof mode work is there's actually an opportunity for many attestations along the way. So you have the point of capture, then the point of verification, and then another expert saying, I've reviewed this and I'm a cultural expert. Here's my stamp of approval. So you get layers and layers of provenance and authentication which I think can be very useful um, to support. And the use cases that you all would think about are different from the Adobe. I mean, some of you are in video production and will think about the video production workflow, but in an academic or a legal uh, case, you'll think about a different set of attestations. Yeah, so uh, that was mostly along the lines of the question I was gonna ask actually, but um, you know, we've talked a lot about Twitter today, but Twitter has these things, you know, the community notes now, right? Where like somebody posts something and then somebody can post something saying, hey, actually that's not true, right? Um, so with something like proof mode where you're, you know, generating cryptograph cri uh, cryptographic proof that this photo was taken at this location and it's verifiable, um, you know, my question is more of like a social thing, like how do you con how do you convince non-technical people that that is something that they can believe, right? Um, because, you know, we, we've got a fair mix of both technical and non-technical people in this room. Some of us probably understand the underpinnings of how that proof is generated, some don't. Um, and, you know, your average person browsing Twitter, like how, how do they know that they're a community note they're seeing is is accurate, right? It's it's mostly just like, uh, you know, they they make a judgment call, right? So how how would you convince somebody who's non technical, looking at this that this is indeed proof that it like and the proof that they can understand? Um, part one, quick answer. So I I was. I lived through the shift of from HTTP to HTTPS and the years of trying to convince non-technical organizations to do it. And eventually this moment came where we made it easy enough and cheap enough and it was just the norm. It became the default. And if you don't have it, people won't trust you. Similarly, SMS texting, right? Everyone texts it. Well, now everyone's moved to apps with security and privacy. And if you're the wrong color bubble or you're just texting me, I think you're spam, right? Asking me to click on something. So we've shifted now, again, the signal moment, right? The encryption moment. So in the same way, getting random photos that have no provenance and authentication will be seen as sketchy and just something you don't trust. And that's fine with me as long as that doesn't mean we're centralizing that trust. And so we're gonna have that shift. 
Um, part two is that, yes, there are still gatekeepers to knowledge and information and media brands, and we just need to get them to wholesale adopt this and show provenance and authentication in any way in, in, their, in their content. So, um, so it'll, be, it'll be that big technical shift moment where it's cheap and easy and becomes the default, and then it'll be getting institutions to adopt it um, who are information gatekeepers. Thank you very much. Well, hello. Let's see if I can get this to work. Seems to work. Uh, I should figure out what I do to advance. Okay, I just press that button. Uh, no, I, I already switched it. So, hello and welcome to, uh, we are from the Sprightly Institute. Um, this talk is New Foundations for Network Communities. Well, what does that mean? So, first of all, some introductions. Hi, I'm Christine Lemmer Weber. I'm the CTO of the Sprightly Institute. And this is David Thompson. I'm the core infrastructure architect at the Sprightly Institute. <laughs> and may I say, it's very exciting to be sitting here talking at MIT because uh, Dave and I come from the school of hard thunks. Uh, you know, like if you open my uh, uh, my mouth, you know, like sometimes at 1980s, uh, uh, like da na 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 na, might come out distorted in VHS like noise. So, like the MIT open courseware stuff is actually really valuable to uh, us internally, and uh, um, the the very idea of knowledge uh, preservation. Um, so we are a research institution. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. All the stuff we're doing is open source, free software, choose your term, all available for everyone. It's all open. Uh, um, we write papers. We try to disseminate knowledge. Um, so um, research means collaboration. We work with a number of these fine institutions, including, you may see at the top, FFDW, right? Thank you. Um, and uh, um, I want to talk here for a moment, though, about network communities at a high level. Because, you know, OK, there's lots of low-level tech we can talk about, but we really need to ground it, right? So uh, who here knows what ActivityPub is? Raise your hand. OK, a few people. Who here has ever heard of Mastodon, Decentralized Social Network? OK, most people. All right. Uh, ActivityPub is the specification that connects together all those nodes. I'm co-author, the lead author on that specification. So we've got some experience getting this stuff out there. Currently, the, may I say, the most popular decentralized social network uh, uh, protocol in the world. And, uh, um, and, but uh, I'm not the only expert here. Um, our executive director, Randy Farmer, has built literally the world's first like, really majorly deployed social network. This is Lucasfilm's Habitat, a graphical virtual world, first of its kind, running on a Commodore 64 in 1985. That should not happen. It had garbage collection, and it ran on a Commodore 64, and like they did like, th this shouldn't happen, right? And they had they, like, you know, like, how do we describe these things that they're, they're the people, but they're not the people? So they like, they like, you know, coined the technical version of the term um, avatar, right? Because there just wasn't those terms around, right? Um, so, you know, like, let's look at this slide. Hmm, decentralized stuff, huh? We're at the decentralized stuff place, right? So, okay, scalable, open, Decentralized, traversable, commercial, social, secure, and portable. This sounds like all the things we want. Well, this is from a document, this global cyberspace infrastructure architecture thing. This, um, uh, I could. I'll just point at all these things again. Do, 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 do. Thank you, Jerry. Um, uh, so, so this is amazing you have that on hand. Uh, this is from 1995. You know, like, and this, this came out then. And you're like, okay, so they wrote this paper. Cute, right? Here's a 3D virtual world with a player-run economy, fully peer-to-peer. -peer. You could run code you didn't trust using, by the way, object capability security, the very approach your student, Jonathan Reese, um, ended up taking in his paper, right? Um, so you could do all this stuff, right? 1995, right? You can move between worlds, host on a peer-to-peer -peer network. What? How does this, this is from a demo from 1997, a real one. You can watch it online. Uh, Randy Farmer, co-founder, worked on that. And like, you know, kind of died in the dot-com crash. But it turns out a lot of these good ideas are around, and they can be revived, right? So we're going to talk about a story a little bit. This is our friend Alicia. You know, she's, you, this is kind of the high-level future story of where we're going, right? Because we're going to focus on more on low-level tech. Uh, Alicia is a math teacher at high school. She also plays tabletop board games with her friends. And she also likes to author fan fiction. And Alicia behaves differently in each one of these contexts. And yet we don't think of her as duplicitous, right? And she needs software that can handle the richness of her life, that she can behave in these different ways. 
Um, and here, here's kind of a mock-up. We've actually built some things that are like this, but it's a cute mock-up of where things will eventually look, um, of her talking with her friends. And this is actually, there's some interesting, sophisticated things in here. I don't have time to go into detail about this being a decentralized uh, name system, no blockchain involved, um, uh, um, and the way that that works. I'm not going to focus on that. I just want to give you the idea that we are going towards a more high-level vision of things. But, but, <gasps> but. It's simply too hard to build this stuff right now. Next slide, Christine. Oh, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, end of talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through a, a few key points. So first, secure distributed programming is hard. Next slide. Um, so at Threatly Institute, we're working on a, 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 a little library called Goblins. It's a distributed cooperative transactional programming environment in which um, building secure and distributed programming uh, programs looks an awful lot like the typical linear code we're used to writing right now. Um, so our aim is to make distributed security that you can understand. And the basic idea is uh, much like a car key. If you don't have it, you can't use it. So not access control list, role-based access, centralized authority, uh, but decentralized authority. And um, you use it, you use these keys and pass references around as, as just arguments. It's, it's, it's a function call, an, an argument passing, standard things that programmers are used to. Slide. Um, so uh, this is a little demo of just a, well, a screenshot of something I built in my, my first week. Um, so this was back in December. Um, I had not used this object capability thing that we're so big about at the Sprightly Institute. And Christine asked me, like, well, okay, you're on the job now. Learn this and make a little demo. Make an interactive, um, make an interactive like garden demo. I, I like to garden. So make, so make a program on the network that is secure. Next slide. Um, and here you see uh, this very simple program uh, with two clients that are actually talking over a uh, peer-to-peer network and collaborating over uh, Tor Onion services. And uh, what's interesting about this is that, one, I didn't know. Again, I did not know how to do this when I started on Monday and had this done by Friday. And um, <laughs> uh, I developed this program without consideration of the network. I just modeled the, the things in the world. There are plants. There's a tile grid. There's some... Uh, control around what is allowed to be planted in a garden. It's, it's modeled as a community garden. You can't just go in and like plant mint that would just take over or something. You know, there's there's some rules here. And I modeled all of that. And then thanks to goblins, I was able to hook it up to the network and the interactivity kind of fell out. So goblins has abstracted the networking component from me. Um, and objects that were once local are could be on another machine and, and they, I interact with them the same way. And here we have a little uh, GIF. Um, so it's not just about games and stuff. How about like a you know a multi-user um, chat application? And here what we're seeing is not only a single chat program, um, but um, a, a chat program implemented across several languages. We have one that's um, using Guile Scheme. We have another that's using Racket. Um, and they are talking over um, the same protocol uh, that we're working on standardizing with additional parties, which we'll go into a little bit more, called the Object Capability Network, or OCAPN. Um, and there's one more thing I know you like to mention about this slide. Um, this is 150 lines of code for both the user code and the rooms. And yet, it's fully peer-to-peer, end-to-end encrypted. And, um, and and it has decentralized names. They're actually not really visible in this, but the, it, it is using that type of mechanism. Um, and, uh, and, and, there, and all of that work, you're not, you know, I've done a lot of work on protocol design. But you don't have to think about it in terms of protocol design. You just write code about the objects that should be talking to each other, and they can talk to each other because we've abstracted that. Right. Next slide. Um, so yeah. So I mean, just making a distributed program is difficult. But what about when you run into problems? Well, debugging is even more difficult. Um, next slide, please. So uh, one of the things we're developing is what we're calling the time traveling distributed debugger. Time travel. What what the heck does that mean? Um, and it means that in our system, we're actually retaining state. Changes in state happen in transactions. We keep records of those transactions. And you're able to, uh, using our debugging tools, actually go back to previous state in the program and examine what things were like during particular asynchronous events to try to find you know, maybe, maybe the, where the state got corrupted in the program. Um, yes? Uh, distributed. 
program is the case that the time is really a partial order, not a total order. Yes, that's uh, correct. We're about to get there. You're <laughs> jumping ahead. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Great. You're <laughs> so uh, we're not going to go over all this, of course, but this we have a blog post about what we're building. Um, and it, we use we like to use games as, as fun examples, and this goes through like a, a dungeon crawling RPG, and it shows what happens when when hit point calculation is wrong, and how we how we go back and, and try to find where that happened, and then and then replace the problematic behavior while the program is running, and then retry it. And, and debugging against the, the objects, debugging against the objects as they existed in the moment that you're currently the stack frame you're currently basically uh, examining against. Next slide, please. And this is just some example output of our debugging tools. And, and uh, as, as Jerry was saying, this is showing a partial order, uh, causality order of events in the distributed system. There are basically three machines that we've named player, cave, monster, simulating the player's machine, the dungeon, and where the monster's living. Let's say these were all in different machines. And giving a causality graph of, of the different um, asynchronous actions that produce the buggy behavior. What's, that, what's the name of this? Oh, it's a Lamport diagram. So it's a so time time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank th th thank you. So so at the top we're talking oldest, in the bottom newest. So that the arrows flowing flowing down in time. Correct. Oh no wait no. Yeah. Actually. Oh, no, this is me. Yeah. I'm turning it over to Christine. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, no, that was great. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, um, but network protocols are hard, right? I've spent a lot of time doing network protocol design, right? And like, you know, the idea is like, you have to be an expert, right? When you design security systems, <gasps> you have to be an expert and you have to worry a lot about the structure of these messages going back and forth. No, because we've done that hard work for you. We've done that hard work for you so that you can just focus on doing the programming, just the way that the messages flow back and forth on the network, and the generalized mechanism of secure communication is already taken care of. Uh, and we've done a lot of work on this. So here, for example, um, we see uh, a machine that has Alicia and Arthur on it. She is introducing Ben to Arthur, um, but it gets more complicated than that because here we have three different machines on the network, and even though they have pairwise understanding of uh, um, objects between each other, we have developed this fancy way to be able to get the three things to talk to each other, and, and you get the illusion um, of a network uh, of, of programming with a single global computer, but only with the authority that you've been handed. You can only work the authority you have. And um, we've done all this hard work up front. We're writing papers, we're writing standards on this, right? Um, and so you get to benefit from us having already done this stuff for you. Um, and so, yeah, okay, we gotta finish this diagram. It's just so good, right? You know, so like the, the all these things can, <laughs> Don't worry about understanding it, right? This is actually a thing for specification implementators. The point is, is that this is for people who are doing an implementation of the protocol, but the users of the protocol do not need to understand this, right? They just need to worry about ordinary programming. That is the big deal, right? Users of HTTPS do not need to understand SSL slash TLS, right? It is abstracted for them. We are doing that with distributed programming. All right. But explaining these ideas is hard, right? It's hard, right? Well, gosh, if only there were institutions that tried to explain hard ideas. But we are writing papers about it, right? Um, um, the, here's a paper talking about our very whole approach, doing all this stuff, ranging from, and, uh, um, and it talks about capability securities, ordinary program. It walks through all these different diagrams. Um, uh, Juliana, who's in the back, did a wonderful amount of work making this, uh, um, this, this paper very readable. Um, we've also talked about how our decentralized naming approach works, right? We've talked about that type of stuff. Um, we've even actually written, this is actually the most popular paper we've written. It's like SICP condensed into 30 pages. It's actually used as a tutorial for several things. I've had a bunch of emails from people saying, wow, I, I had a hard time getting an SICP, but I did this in about an hour, and then I finally was able to understand SICP, right? So like this, like, so we're, we're, you know, we're using these terrifying things at the parentheses to like modern people, and we're, we're trying to make that a little bit less terrifying, right? But why are we doing all this, right? And it's because Ideas, you know, we, we say we're an in, a research institution. We're making wonderful technology and we want you to use it, right? We have a hit, we have working with an organization of people who have a history of shipping technology that people use, right? But we also are working with a history of a, a group of people who have a history of shipping ideas that then percolate outward, right? We want you to steal our ideas, right? You know, so we're, um, 
probably the Sprightly Institute is like, you know, like has some some of the people who like to scour. Um, I've actually inherited like Jonathan Reese's collection of like a whole bunch of old MIT papers. Like we love this crap, right? And it's important that people archive this stuff. It's important that this type of stuff be kept alive because uh, otherwise else, you know, we lose a lot of knowledge. And it's also important because we want these ideas to disseminate out so that this just becomes obviously the natural way in which think people do things, right? Took a while for GoTo to become a, a considered harmful, right? But eventually, everybody's just like, of course, you know, why GoTo? Why would I be using that, right? You know? Um, so anyway, I'm gonna hand it back to Dave. Sure, let's talk a little technical uh, <laughs> for a moment. Um, so maybe you think what we're talking about is cool, maybe you don't, but I'm just gonna assume that you do. Um, well, sounds great. How do you get it into the hands of users? You're, you're talking about using Scheme? and who, who uses that, and like, why would I? Um, well, <laughs> here's an example of scheme code, and this, in fact, is uh, it's just an implementation of a cellular automaton called Wireworld. It's kind of like the game of life, but we think it's more fun. It emulates uh, computer circuits. Uh, but before we get to the next slide, you know, great, cool, maybe I like this, maybe I don't, but how are people going to use it? How are users who aren't programmers going to just like access the stuff you make? Yeah, it's great, but it only runs on, say, Linux in a particularly uh, I don't know, niche Linux distribution, like, great, you're not gonna reach anybody. Well, um, Hoot is, uh, can you go back two slides actually, Christine? We have this project called Hoot, and, and what's the purpose of that project? It is to take all of the stuff we have been writing and put it in the web browser so that anyone with a web browser on your phone or anything can use our stuff. So we can produce demos, we can produce real applications, we have uh, many plans uh, around actually getting things in the hand of regular people. Uh, two slides ahead. So this is an example of the wire world cellular automaton. Um, what you see are a simulation of electrons moving around on copper wires. And this is scheme code compiled uh, down to WebAssembly and then running in um, what right now are just uh, the latest uh, bleeding edge web browsers. Um, but is soon going to be deployed on everything. Next slide. I'll hand it back to Christine. Okay, hand it back to me. By the way, one more thing about this. I always get to give them the last word, right? Uh, the uh, um, one more thing about this, though, is you know there have been languages that have been compiling to JavaScript and et cetera for a while. One of the things that we're doing right now is we're compiling specifically to WebAssembly, right? And WebAssembly is kind of that dream that people have been chasing for a long time of having the universal VM, right? And um, one of the nice things about that is it means that we're on the same level as like JavaScript and so on and so forth. Um, we have tail calls in the browser, <laughs> efficiently. All right, so what's on the roadmap for 2024? We're working on persistence. You shouldn't just have to not worry about how the network works. You shouldn't have to worry about how you store your objects. It should be automatic that these things persist to disk. You, they should be able to describe how they are, but a popper in your virtual world should be able to describe itself but not turn itself into a king. It should not be able to give itself a million gold. It should not be able to give itself a, uh, um, a magical sword that can kill anything, but it should be able to describe itself. We're taking the same mechanism, Lambda, the ultimate security model. We're taking that and we are also turning it into a serialization mechanism that you don't even have to think about, it just happens. Um, we're working on new net layers for OCAPN so that it works over libpdp, all sorts of other things. That other demo you saw was kind of slow and that's actually because we're using Tor, which is not the fastest thing on Earth. Uh, uh, goblins is agnostic to the particular transport. Goblins is agnostic to the particular transport, exactly. You could have a carrier pigeon moving this type of stuff around, node work. Um, we're getting this stuff in the browser, and we're starting to work on the actual social user interfaces along the lines of what you saw in those demos. Um, but we are a research institution. We want to work with you. If you are excited about this, then why not talk to us, right? These little characters are around a campfire. They're making a new universe. That's what we want to do, right? Let's make this new universe together, right? Uh, so any questions? Did you confuse everybody? I don't know. There's a state that I Oh, okay, good. Well, no, I was <laughs> <laughs> Say, yeah. We're really excited about this, and at some point soon, we'll we're going to try building our like verification workflow for human rights organizations on top of this. So, if you think about all the people in the that chain of verification, this could be a great way to coordinate that across systems. So, we're excited to take a crack at it. I, I have a question for you, Christine, just to like a set you up for something. We, we've been talking a lot about we built goblins, and it's a special thing, and it's in Scheme, and we're putting it in the browser and everything, but. 
Is it just that, or are we talking, you know, we, we mentioned a protocol earlier. We're talking about opening this up to, to everything, right? Not just people that are like parentheses. <laughs> so so the, 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 the goal, I'm not exactly sure. There's about 50 ways I can interpret your question. Yes. So I will interpret it in terms of, there, we are trying to make this be something that is for everyone, not just scheme enthusiasts, right? We are scheme enthusiasts. You know, I'm banging on my copy of SICP up here, right? You know, love it, right? Not everybody's into it, right? The, the activity pub, right, you know, there's no one language that speaks activity pub. There's many languages that speak activity pub, right? You saw Guile and, and, and Racket, both, both of them have lots of parentheses, but it's okay, that's not required. It's being intentionally. In fact, we're working with folks uh, at Agoric who are building a JavaScript version of things. We just got a Haskell version of uh, the, 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 the thing. So if Schema and Haskell can talk to each other, you're probably fine, right? If Screaming Haskell and JavaScript can talk to each other, then you're definitely fine, right? So um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do my try contextualizing of this. That uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, questions we have is if you're if 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 the world is centralized, if the internet is centralized, and essentially a lot of the research and development on the internet has moved in the last ten to fifteen years within Google and Facebook and Microsoft. And while a lot of that support has been extremely general support and the results of that have been open source, incredibly powerful open source projects like Kubernetes, um, the Go language, uh, even, even things like Rust, um, it's inevitable that the solutions that those, that the, the problems that those um, open source projects are attempting to solve are the problems of large centralized services. Yes. Um, and so the question that, that was always sort of directed at us is if you're trying to provide a decentralized alternative to this, how can you do it? How can you do it even if you, I mean, we have some resources, but you're, you're competing against large vested interests who've also had the money to uh, draw in a uh, lot of the smartest minds in this space. Um, and you know, this is something that I know academia struggles with as much as, as people in the commercial space or voluntary space trying to build this. And uh, one of the theories that we ran on at FFDW is that there is a, a, a vast space of research that has already existed, existed for decades on solutions to these problems that it's simply not being exploited or used not not through any malicious intent, but just because it's not a description of the problems that these large companies are doing. And uh, when Sprightly came to us, it was very clear that they were drawing on a, that tradition, a tradition that has its core at MIT, and that by drawing on that tradition, we would be standing on the shoulders of giants. And the other thing, I mean, we, uh, Christine talked about how David got up to speed of this in a few hundred lines of code within a week. I think it's worth saying that all of these things from building a, uh, a platform, a network agnostic system of technology using um, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 within this language um, and then porting it to uh, the novel uh, web assembly thing, uh, Sprightly has done that in a year. And that's not just because the sprightly people are geniuses. Um, it's because it's because they are building on 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 the resources and the technology that that has been incubated at MIT, but most importantly, propagated by open learning. Um, that that oh, I understood what what Christine was talking about because I, like Juan Bennett, had sat and read SICP and learned all the the the, the thinking that was going on at MIT. So. I, I just want to build on that and say um, I'm I'm not a traditionally trained computer scientist. I uh, what my background was a um, I was an interdisciplinary humanities student. I'm proud of it. I love love that background. Um, and you know I got into programming and I got you know did work on stuff like ActivityPub and stuff like that. And I hit these problems where I was like I just don't know how to architect solutions, right? And that's why I got SICP and that's why I started getting to, going down that road. And you know having I you know I spent a year of just like watching the SICP lectures in the evening, like the old 1980s ones, and you know being able to going through the exercise and being able to learn all that type of stuff. So yes, um, we we really we're we're not just 
we're really grateful to be here. I think Dave and I are both like a little bit embarrassed, may I say, to be up on stage uh, in, front of, in, in front of this audience, but, like, um, but we're trying to pay it forward, right? Movement and Richard Stallman and the Gnook project, which Absolutely. you all depend upon. That's right. We were, we're, we're building on the free software movement for certain, you know, and we're, and, and most of us internally have, yeah, and most of us, most of us also internally are free software activists. Yes, and I, I, I did work at the Free Software Foundation for uh, a brief period of time. So, yeah, very, <laughs> very connected to that community. All right, any other questions? We're going to move on to Jack. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for having me. I'm uh, Jack Cushman from the Library Innovation Lab. Uh, today I'm gonna tell you about PERMA Tools, which is a project that we have to let anyone run their own web archive. And I'm gonna try to convince you that you should do that. Uh, especially if, you know, for example, if you happen to be taking a bunch of open courses and shipping them around the world on hard drives and they had outbound links to them, it might be really useful to run your own offline web archive that you can ship with it. Uh, if we were thinking, you know, off the top of our heads about potential applications. Uh, so let's talk about web archiving and uh, start by talking about the Library Innovation Lab. Uh, our mission is to grow knowledge and community by bringing library principles to technological frontiers. So what are library principles? Uh, there are many. There's long lists on the web. Um, one is to uh, collect knowledge, preserve knowledge, and access knowledge, kind of the core thing that libraries do. I have a Freudian slip here I wrote create because I think libraries need to get involved in creating knowledge as well, but it ought, really ought to be collect and curate. Okay, so this is like the core, you know, standard mission of libraries. In a decentralized conference setting, I think the most interesting way to think about libraries is as the only scalable technology that I know. This is probably a lie, but it's an interesting lie, so go with me on it. Uh, I think that libraries are a deeply scalable technology uh, because they are local, because they are responsive to their communities, because at the end of the day, the more libraries you have, the richer and more robust and more flexible and more survivable your community is. And that's not true of most technologies. A lot of the internet technologies that uh, arrived on our door in the last 20 or 30 years didn't feel that way. Like the more we have of these, the more we feel like a stable, robust society. But that's true of libraries and it's worth thinking about why. Those are the library principles that we want to bring. Um, the reason that it's true is that libraries can function as your cultural memory. If your culture is an organism, a library can be your long-term memory and the part that lets you coordinate, the part that lets you know where you came from, what you know, and be able to add new things to that, be able to uh, take collective action, be able to be wise. Uh, this is the part of having libraries that remains a vital function, even as you may no longer use a library to look something up in an encyclopedia. You probably use Wikipedia for that these days, and in the olden days, you probably would have gone down to your library and checked their big encyclopedia. We're not doing that for you anymore, but we still have a vital role in being your cultural memory. Uh, so how does memory work on the web? The thing about moving our short-term memory, our conversation, our kind of you know, ongoing interaction as a society to the internet, to the World Wide Web, uh, is that it has this weird temporal quality to it. Websites appear and disappear. This is what we call link rot or reference rot. You have like whatever can you access today, uh, and it's different from what you could have accessed yesterday or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, and links, uh, this blew my mind when I started to get this doing web archiving. Links have this temporal dimension. You create a link at a moment in time, and it points to a thing that will never exist again, which is what that web page looked like at that moment in time. We don't write down what time we made it. Links don't have a date attached to them, but they have an implicit uh, date uh, that's missing. You have to understand what did the person mean? What were they thinking of? What were they trying to show me at the time that they made it? So if you imagine the web kind of crawling through history, there's all these links firing back and forth that across each other to missing things. Um, and that means that if we're your cultural memory, if we're your long-term memory, we should be helping uh, knit this back together, helping you remember what was in a way that turns it into knowledge so that you can take action. Uh, so what do we try to do that? Uh, I think one piece of this is centralized archives. Um, the Internet Archive uh, has a foundational and necessary place, incredibly, uh, so much foresight and so much investment that was uh, required to make that exist. Uh, our project Perma CC is a much smaller archive, but you know, I threw us on the slide too. Uh, there's things like the uh, UK Web Archive, which has the mission of collecting everything under the .UK 
domain name. They won't share it with everyone, but um, they're collecting it, and that's really important. So this is like the centralized archive approach. You can have a few well-resourced uh, archives that have a collection policy. They collect certain things for certain reasons, and things are in or out according to them. Um, if we are your cultural memory, it's worth thinking about, like, do you want to have like only three of us? Like, does this feel good enough? Uh, I think I think the centralized approach has this problem that there's too few policies, too few approaches to helping you remember what was there. Uh, I think the other answer that I put on here, particularly because a lot of you are technical and be thinking, well, we can fix this problem of the time dimension of the web. We can use something like content addressable storage, like IPFS, or maybe we can layer on some financial incentives, uh, like the Filecoin network, to um, it's like, well, we'll no longer have the problem of losing stuff, so we won't need archives that each have collection policies because we'll just have everything. Uh, and that can't work for a couple of reasons, one of which is just there aren't enough hard drives. And um, David Rosenthal of the Locks Project has good graphs of how much data are we making and how many hard drives are we making, and the gap gets wider every year. So you can't plan, like, let's just save everything. You have to be selective. Uh, and the other problem is that when you're being selective, you want that selection to be thoughtful. You want it to have a policy because that's how you form memories. You know, you do stuff and then you sleep and dream and lay down memories and they help you navigate the rest of your life. Uh, what archives do for you, what libraries do for you, is take the world of data and turn it into memory. Uh, so these are all useful. Mine is also useful, although not the most one. But uh, they're, not, they're not a sufficient answer to if you want to continue to be able to function as a society, to act like a, an integrated whole instead of like, um, what I feel cynically are, we are right now, which is like feeling that like we've lost our long-term memory, that we struggle to form collective action. Uh, all right. So um, we need lots of institutions to get to build cultural memories with their own policies. We need trust in the records that they're creating um, so that we can knit our memory back together. How do we do that? Well, now let's get totally technical. That was the big picture of like, this is why it matters. This is the, I have an actual tool that you can use today that will help. Uh, Waxy. Uh, Waxies are signed web archives that can be played back in browsers without needing server software. Uh, part of why web archives uh, aggregate, part of why there's only a few of them, is it is very expensive to play back something like a full recording of CNN.com. That thing originally was generated by like 100 servers. It's complicated to run, but if you can bundle it all up into a static file and play it back in the client, it gets a lot cheaper to run your own archive. Uh, so this is my... Uh, Number one takeaway for the talk, that's why there's red arrows. Thanks to Waxy, web captures are like JPEGs now. That is, they are static objects that you can keep wherever you want, do whatever you want with. Uh, what can you do with JPEGs? We can create them and edit them and post them, SMS them, email them, organize them and create them however you want. You can remix them and you can witness them, as we heard from Nathan. Uh, Okay, what do we mean by witness? Well, this is gonna be more complicated, but Nathan already told us what we mean by witness. A lot of times we care about the provenance chain that an archive, uh, a web archive took to get to us. We care who saw it along the way. Uh, and uh, we now have, um, there's a waxy signing standard that's specific to web archives so that you can record um, which, uh, essentially which URL you downloaded them from. So if you download it from Harvard's witness, you can show like, I got this from witness.permacc. If you download it from Stanford, you could say, I got this from Stanford, and so on and so forth. Um, or alternatively, there's the C2PA standard, which we are also participating uh, with and trying to adapt to the web archiving needs. Um, and this becomes a really important technical part because then you can effectively distribute this stuff. You can have uh, one group with the responsibility of saying what is on the live web, other groups with the responsibility of keeping things or organizing them or helping turning them into these memories. Um, so this is the, uh, the kind of the secret plan in like, and don't read the slide, this is just like, I want, I want a sense of the, um, the, the community or ecosystem that I imagine emerging around this standard, which is to say, because it is well designed to allow uh, each piece of the uh, ecosystem to handle its own uh, responsibilities and then pass on the file to the next piece, we can have a lot of diversity about each step. So um, we can have lots of different things making recordings of the web, uh, lots of things witnessing, oh, I see who you are and where you got this from, lots of things uh, passing them around, and then lots of ways to present them. Uh, so we go from having that kind of monolithic view where either the Internet Archive, our project, the UK National Library is doing the whole thing from start to finish, and you have to embrace their entire pipeline to getting to mix and match and choose how you are going to preserve the stuff that you 
care about. And my hope is that will mean a flowering of different archives with different ways to help us remember history. Um, I'll, I'll show you a few of those very quickly. Uh, one is from the Me Too project of the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. Uh, the Me Too uh, web archive uh, crawled uh, just a large collection set of documents related to the Me Too movement, uh, websites related to the Me Too movement. Uh, they used um, the Internet Archives Archivate service to do that, which is available to Harvard and presumably MIT and many other universities. Uh, but they wanted to sort of show it off, let you browse the stuff that they'd collected. Uh, so they're using uh, some of our software tools to um, embed uh, gigabytes of web crawls, uh, many, many pages, fully in the client in this box so that you can browse their entire collection. Uh, this is sort of an early way to uh, present this. They're using kind of our off-the-shelf tools and not adding a lot of their own UI to them. Uh, another example of this uh, approach where um, I can't claim credit, by the way, for this uh, article, um, but uh, we're working with Starling Labs that did create this article. Uh, this was a Rolling Stone investigation um, that involved using a bunch of um, uh, signed waxy archives to uh, document, uh, what were they even investigating? Oh, help me. Yes, uh, war, war crimes investigation. Uh, and uh, I think they did a great job of highlighting the power of signing archives because part of their work here was to um, edit the archives, redact things that were dangerous, but also offer evidence. So um, in the course of this article, you weren't just reading the text of the journalist explaining what happened, but you'd go see the evidence that they had shown and you could see the provenance chains that got it there, including when things had to be edited for safety, who had edited it. Uh, and I think this, uh, this sort of federated approach to trust that you can use cryptography to show how something got here, but also sometimes say, hey, if you wanted to know more, you'd have to talk to this person and this person and this person. Uh, offered this great uh, balance, this, this way that they could create a memory that had authenticity to it and texture to it. Um, yeah. This uh, proof was used in this as well, and then unified CTP metadata and like storage on Filecoin, all that kind of brought them together. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I love this. I love this uh, Rolling Stone article as an example of sort of seeing seeing these tre threads we've been working on come together. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't remember the title of it when I picked it. Like this guy that was a hidden war criminal who's been living in Boston and still. Uh, Th thank you for helping uh, my my memory. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I'll show one more um, if this if this video can play. Um, is there a button on here? If I yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is a very similar thing. This is one file that has a bunch of different recordings of WhiteHouse.gov. Uh, but we did a little bit of interactivity to it, so we added a slider to switch between versions of it. Uh, so these are fully interactive captures of the web page, uh, switching back and forth between them so you can compare different points in time, uh, but with nothing going on on the server. This is just a static file that you could ship around the world, that you could host an IP, IPFS, that you can use in your way to create the presentation that you want to create. You can see how responsive it is, that was real time, uh, but also how easy it is to ship. Uh, and my hope is that this demo, more than anything, will make programmers in the room say, oh, I need to steal this and do something really cool with it. Uh, because I think this really this shows how different it is when you can take web archives and use them uh, for your purposes in your way. Uh, we have a suite of tools to do this at tools.permacc, uh, which uh, has the, the core capture software that we use, the signing software that we use, uh, and that powers permacc itself, our, our product. Uh, and I think uh, we don't yet have the um, API layer, but that'll be the next thing to ship on the site uh, in the next few months. Uh, that's what I had to share. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, so again, I'm uh, Clayton Hinsworth. I'm the director of MIT Video. Um, and just want to give a quick update on uh, where we are with the uh, MIT Video Archive uh, digitization project. Um, unfortunately, I have not followed any of the uh, Tufty um, uh, ideas where you don't just put a, a bunch of uh, words on slides, so uh, bear with me, even though I'm supposedly a creative, uh, we have words on slides. Um, <laughs> all right, just to give a quick um, brief uh, context for the, the data, uh, for the archive, um, it started, you know, it, there's some earlier content that uh, predates this, but for the most part it starts in the late 70s, early 80s, 
currently we have about uh, 52,796 records. Um, and that spans everything from one inch, two inch tape all the way up to digital stuff we're shooting um, as of yesterday. Um, we add about 22,000 uh, records per year. Um, even during the pandemic, we were adding, um, you know, 1,000, uh, 1,500 records. Um, what we first did uh, with the, the help of Filecoin was engage AVP, which is an audiovisual preservation um, consultant, to help us think about how to approach this project. Um, you know, we've gone through fits and starts of trying to digitize this um, and haven't gotten all that far. So um, they were extremely helpful in putting together um, a document uh, to think about the strategy and how we might approach this. Um, initially, I was thinking we would just go and digitize everything and, you know, let somebody else sort it out. Um, but uh, after working with them, you know, really started thinking about um, uh, the need to curate that more and really look through the archive and, and decide what uh, what's important, what's not. Um, in total, we had somewhere between 30 to 40, 34,000 uh, um, tape-based um, pieces of content. So that's a lot of digitization. Um, as part of the conversation, we actually engaged with a, a whole bunch of the community, um, a number of people from Open Learning who are also creating content. Um, and other people around the community that, that create content. So OCW, MIT Residential, um, the News Office, the MIT Museum, um, and more importantly, the MIT Libraries as part of the distinctive collection. So they are the holder of the MIT archives in its more greater, um, the greater sense. Um, and in fact, what was very interesting in that conversation was uh, they don't decide what's important, um, they simply take what is given to them and are the stewards of it, uh, which I thought was a very, uh, was a surprise to me um, and and sort of felt very similar to how we've been <laughs> thinking about all of the content we've created over the years. Um, with that, um, we're thinking about, you know, next steps. Uh, what do we want to do uh, with the content, thinking about how we're going to use it? Right now, we have a, a FileMaker database um, that is only as good as the people who have entered the data into it, which means there are some really good years and there are some really, really bad years. If you can give me the date and the location that we recorded something for you, I can probably find it. If you say it was sometime in 2013, good luck. <laughs> Um, and with that, there is, a, there is a decent amount of metadata in that, um, but what has become very clear to me is in this process, what we also want to do is think about how do we add some additional metadata to this archive. So as we go through the digi digitization process, um, really thinking about um, partnering with a couple uh, different organizations or different um, uh, vendors who will actually do both transcription and then some machine learning on a lot of the content using computer vision, so sort of an AI um, machine learning approach. Um, as part of this project, uh, we, we made a, a short film, which I'm going to torture you all with once again for those of you who weren't here um, at the end of this, but we were looking for a specific um, faculty member that, that we wanted to, to show in it. Um, I put her name in and like 10 records came up. She's been a faculty member for probably 20, 30 years, so there's no way that's all we have, but that's all of the metadata that was associated with her name that was in there. Um, so the ability to be able to extract data, look at this, and then ultimately make this available to the community, um, and then with some more, <laughs> certainly a lot more thought, uh, more broadly to the world. Um, is certainly something that, that is part of the project and something that, that we're thinking about. Um, ultimately, you know, our goal is to bring this into some sort of uh, MAM, so media asset management system, and thinking about how w might we apply that more broadly to the MIT community. Um, we are the de facto uh, video production group within MIT. That being said, we are not anywhere near the only people making video at MIT, um, which should be very obvious. Um, and to think of all the content that is put out um, that's on YouTube channels that is lost because people, people started it with a random Google account um, and that there is no archive for that, there is no play, uh, central repository, um, is something that does not keep me up, but is one of the first things I think of when I wake up, <laughs> oftentimes. Um, 
and so really thinking about how we might more broadly um, think about to, to provide this uh, resource more broadly to the community um, and what that, what that might look like. Um, you know, if we were to uh, move forward with this project and, and just using sort of um, base transcription <laughs> uh, pricing to do all of the content that we have would be somewhere in the multi, you know three four million dollars just in the transcription. So obviously the digitization, the storage, all of that. Particularly if you think about um, a place like MIT, which while uh, certainly not small, is not the largest place creating content, uh, is pretty pretty daunting to think about um, in terms of managing that data and 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 preserving that data. Um, and with that. Um, I do want to show the video again, but I do want to just note that um, there's a clip of uh, Ray Weiss in here talking about gravitational waves in 1980 and saying how he, at some point, he's going to figure out how to do this. Um, and then, obviously, is what he won his Nobel Prize for. Peter. I just want to say one thing, which is that we're not alone in this. Um, um, uh, thanks. Um, I just want to say one thing, which is that you, we, are not alone in this. Um, task in the WGBH down the road is just received uh, a huge grant from the Mellon Foundation to digitize the American Archive. Our friends, uh, the Prelingers, are at work um, with Filecoin support, uh, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and others. We've now reached a point where everyone realizes, or not everyone, but a lot of people <laughs> realize, including people like that we've assembled here, realize how important it is. And um, from a resource development perspective, which is the only one I'm allowed to talk from, um, that is, um, uh, there's some optimism. Thank you. The history of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is rich in both scientific accomplishments and personal achievements. Although it is one of the world's leading technological institutions, its real greatness lies in the people who are connected with it. I am honored by your wish that I should uh, take part in the discussions of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Let's do something really great together. Let's build something which is going to be just mind-boggling in its possibility. Let's build it together so that we can go on and build on top of it. You know, these science problems are tough, uh, but they're fun to work on. Uh, the jobs that are involved with them are, you know, you can have an impact. Open Courseware is a web-based program that will provide free access to primary materials for virtually every course at MIT. One could argue that OCW is the most important achievement that MIT has experienced, helped to create, put on the map in the last decade. Kismet is an anthropomorphic robotic head that is specialized for face-to-face -face interaction between humans and this robot. I still have a dream. Can you dream deeply in the American dream? My husband once said that the inseparable twin of racial injustice is economic injustice. So it is not for us a matter of having come a long, long way, but rather and instead, it is a matter of having still yet a long, long way to go. I think images uh, obviously always appear in a context and the way we uh, think about images is contextually driven. Dr. Adjutant? That looks very much like a, an ordinary camera. What keeps the water out from ruining the film? Well, this camera is uh, like an ordinary camera, except the case acts as a waterproof case. It was developed in uh, France by uh, Captain Jacques Cousteau. Dr. Edgerton has been adapting his electronic flash lamps to photograph another world, which is invisible to the naked eye, the world of the ocean depths. When George Washington, in the middle of the Revolutionary War, decided to wipe out the Iroquois civilization, which was in many ways more advanced than the uh, colonists, except in modes of warfare, uh, he succeeded. A whole lot of numerical linear algebra is built around working with orthonormal vectors, because they never get out of hand. They never overflow or underflow. We have decided to devote the course this year to a study of the space shuttle. 
Our first experiment was very simple. We popped subjects in the scanner and we showed them pictures of faces and pictures of objects like these here. Meanwhile, we're scanning the subject's head as they're just looking at these pictures. How do we use computation to understand the world in which we live? So we have an approach that's very scalable. Uh, we're actually working on scaling this up to meters. I will be willing to predict with certainty that we will detect gravity waves. But it's a long haul and uh, it's not an easy project. I want to take off my academic hat and tell you things that I wish somebody had told me when I was graduating. Every one of you has ability in proportions that are enormous compared to what you believe and what you've ever used.